They know that the Arsenal Football Club's a great club. People know that, all over the country, incidentally, all over the world, incidentally. It's maintained that tradition, it's never lost its class, it's never lost its style, it's managed to change with the times. Everybody will fight for each other, they'll support each other, they'll work for each other. <laughs> this is my life, watching Arsenal play football, especially when we win things. The supporters will refer to them as the Arsenal, capital T, capital A. Once an Arsenal man, always an Arsenal man. It's just the feeling that you are still wearing this big gun on your chest. Because it's family, Arsenal's family. Everything they do, they do with a little bit of style, a little bit of panache. It's just a real nice football club. I think they're a wonderful club, and there's no reason why they still can't be at the top for the next couple of decades at least. But when it comes to class, I think that we're the number one club in Britain. Big club, big support, big tradition, and big history. This is the story of a football club, not just any football club, Arsenal Football Club, whose proud history is garnished with 25 major trophies. Today, their highly talented stars excite and enthrall more than any other side in the country. It's all the far cry from their formation back in the 19th century. In October 1886, 15 workers from the Royal Armaments Factory in Woolwich formed a football team. They called themselves Dial Square after their place of work and two months later played their first ever match against Eastern Wanderers at Millwall, winning 6-0. Shortly afterwards, they became Royal Arsenal, and on January the 8th, 1887, played their first game on Plumstead Common against Erith. This was the side. The key figures were founding father David Danskin and keeper Fred Beardsley, who provided the first kits, courtesy of his former club, Nottingham Forest. From then on, Arsenal played in red. In 1890, the club won its inaugural honours, doing the treble of the Kent Senior Cup, the Junior Cup and the London Charity Cup. And a year later, the first moves were made to go professional. Jack Humble was the driving force behind this bold step. The decisive breakthrough into the league came in 1893, and the football map of England changed forever. Prior to Arsenal, the most southerly clubs had been Birmingham and Burton. By now, they were known as Woolwich Arsenal, but life in the league was a struggle. With no local rivals, travel costs drained the club of its resources. The distance from opposition clubs also affected gates at their manor ground home in Plumstead, where these season tickets would have gained you admission. In their early years, the team laboured in the second division under the guidance of T.B. Mitchell and then George Elcote. The next man in charge, Harry Bradshaw, did succeed, though, and in 1904, the club moved up to Division One. Sadly, Bradshaw didn't stay for the promotion party, so Phil Kelso guided them through life in the top flight for four seasons. With the exception of two FA Cup semi-finals, it was a largely uneventful time. George Morell took charge from 1908 onwards, but the level of football stayed much the same, mid-table mediocrity. This action from the opening day of the 1911-12 season features Arsenal in a 2-2 draw with Liverpool at the Manor Ground. Jack Flanagan and Jackie Chalmers were the scorers, but sadly the newsreel cameras only captured the frantic running about and not the actual goals. It's still, though, an accurate depiction of early 20th century football. In 1913 came the most disappointing moment in the club's history, relegation with a miserable three wins and 18 points. It was the final straw for chairman Henry Norris, and with the club on the brink of extinction, he took the decision to leave Woolwich for good. The club's new home was in North London, at Highbury. 
League football was suspended after 1914 because of the First World War. And when play resumed in 1919, most would have expected Arsenal to still be in Division 2. But negotiations led by Chairman Norris resulted in the Gunners taking their place in the newly extended Division 1. Leslie Knighton was the man in charge for the new era, although he had to work to the specific instructions of Norris, who allegedly forbade him from signing anyone shorter than 5 feet 8. The first game of the 1919-20 season saw Arsenal take on Newcastle at Highbury. 40,000 packed into the ground on the day, but most went home disappointed, with the visitors winning 1-0. It set the tone for the following six seasons, as Arsenal failed to match ambition with achievement. For the upwardly mobile Sir Henry Norris, it was hugely frustrating. The 1924-25 season was the nadir for manager Knighton. Arsenal needed a change. They decided to go for the best man around, and surprisingly, they got him. Inside the marble halls of Highbury stands a permanent tribute to perhaps the most influential figure in the club's history. Herbert Chapman joined Arsenal in 1925 from Champions Huddersfield and transformed his new team into the major force in the English game. I think he was tremendously important. Um, we were unknown when, when he came here, really, and he somehow set the thing in motion that people and followed him managed to uh, continue. And um, I would think he's really the most important person that Arsenal Football Club has really ever had. Chapman's first signing was the legendary Charlie Buchan, an inspirational captain. Then there was Joe Hume from Blackburn and future skipper Tom Parker from Southampton. This team took Arsenal to their first cup final in 1927 against Cardiff at Wembley. King George V was introduced to the Arsenal team by Charlie Buchan, their captains. Cardiff's captain Fred Keenor tossed up and Buchan won his call. Thus began a match that was to make history. In the Arsenal team were names that will stand forever in the Golden Book of Soccer. Men like Joe Hume, Jimmy Brain, Tom Parker, Billy Brythe and Bob John. In the second half, Ferguson shot at Arsenal's goal and he'd scored. Goalie Dan Lewis had let it slip through his fingers. Lloyd George and his daughter Megan acclaimed Cardiff. The slow motion camera records those fateful seconds. Watch how Lewis gets a firm hold of the ball and then by a touch of the elbow puts it into his own net. Did it slip on his jersey? Was he too eager to collect? It's a goal that's been argued about ever since. Anyway, one thing's certain, it won Cardiff the Cup. As the 20s drew to a close, Chapman continued to build his team. Players such as Eddie Hapgood, David Jack, Alex James and the prolific Cliff Bastin were signed and became Highbury legends. Arsenal were now ready to take on the football world with their revolutionary WM formation. The game would never be the same again. These are the Arsenal players from whom the final selection of the team will be made to appear at Wembley on April the 26th. This happy band of brothers was on the verge of making history and that elusive first trophy wasn't far away. Ironically, the 1930 FA Cup final was against Huddersfield, Chapman's old club. In tribute to the manager, both teams ran out side by side the first time this had happened at Wembley. The game went to plan for Chapman and his assistant Tom Whittaker, Alex James giving Arsenal a first-half lead. However, causing a bigger distraction was a German Graf Zeppelin that flew spectacularly overhead. In the 83rd minute, Jack Lambert sealed victory with this goal and captain Tom Parker lifted the cup to mark the start of a decade of Arsenal domination in English football. I need hardly say how pleased I am we have won the cup this afternoon. I'm very proud of the fact that the Arsenal's been successful in bringing the cup south once again. The first championship followed 12 months later in 1931, with Arsenal scoring an incredible 127 goals on the way to the title. The Gunners were a potent force, and everyone in the country wanted to see them at first hand. Many of those on the hillside have already paid admission to the ground. However, they think the view is better even a quarter of a mile away. Well, they know. In front of 67,000 people, this sixth-round FA Cup tie was finally settled by a header from giant centre-half Herbie Roberts. 
Arsenal were on their way back to Wembley, where they would meet Newcastle United. In a keenly fought north-south battle, it was Welsh halfback Bob John who gave Arsenal the lead, much to Chapman's delight. He was never one for outlandish celebrations. But the equaliser from Boyd was given in the most controversial of circumstances. From a high angle, it appeared winger Richardson had run the ball out of play before crossing, a fact confirmed by this artist's impression. Newcastle went on to score again and win the game 2-1, but defeat didn't keep Arsenal down for long, and a season later they went on to win the league, for the second time in three years. One important development was the new kit, their now famous white-sleeved shirts introduced in March 1933. This time the Gunners hit 118 goals on the way to the championship, and in 1934 the title again went to Highbury, but by then their inspirational guiding force was no longer around. On the 6th of January 1934, Herbert Chapman died from pneumonia. All of football mourned his passing, with the streets of North London lined with grieving fans. His legacy was more than titles and triumphs, he set standards that continue to this day at Highbury. In his time, he revolutionised tactics, training, the kit, and he even ensured that the name of the local underground station was changed from Gillespie Road to Arsenal. I think he was a very much a revolutionary. I think he was way ahead of his time. I obviously, I never knew him, but um, my father always said that he ought to have been prime minister. I mean, he was of such a calibre, um, really an outstanding man. Loyal servant George Allison stepped into the breach and the club continued to go from strength to strength. Chapman may have died, but his football philosophy lived on at Highbury. I'm here today with the Arsenal football team and in a moment you'll see just what a fine lot of fellows they are. We're all looking forward most eagerly and in the keenest anticipation to the forthcoming season as league champions. We have the highest standard of football to maintain, and I sincerely hope and trust and believe we will maintain it. Prolific striker Ted Drake's signing from Southampton in 1934 ensured Arsenal's success was perpetuated. It was George, George Allison, and his very first signing, so maybe I might have been dear old Herbert's last, but I wasn't, but I was George's first. And uh, he had a hard job, you know, taking over because Herbert Chapman had set such a great example and whatnot. But George Allison and his players and his team and his trainers and his squad lived up to it, yes. If you look at his record, he did very well. George Allison guided Arsenal to back-to-back -to -back titles, making it three in a row for the club. Their record in recent years and the many star players they've captured have made the Arsenal here playing in white shirts the most talked-of team of this generation. Wherever they play, record crowds are there to see them. The Arsenal don't believe in stunts. For them, it's steady groundwork, tuning muscles up to the highest pitch. Here on the left of the trainer is Hume, famous outside right. And there's Alec James, right in the middle, one of the greatest soccer players in the world, in the middle of the picture again. Outside left, Bastin gives further proof of his versatility. The Arsenal paid 2,000 pounds for his transfer from Exeter City but he certainly justified it. The Arsenal team have reached an extraordinarily high standard. So long as they keep it up, they'll always be taking the ball into the opponent's half and putting it into the net, just like this. Soccer again, and the league teams come out to throw their thousands of supporters, nearly a million of them all over the country, and about 70,000 at Highbury to see the Arsenal, last year's champions, play last year's runners-up, Sunderland, in striped shirts. The Arsenal play like the champions they are, and give the Sunderland defence a most uncomfortable time. Two of their three goals are scored in the first half, Drake netting the equaliser. Now the Arsenal have it all their own way and keep up a continuous pressure. Bastin puts them ahead and most of the crowd realises that soccer has really begun. Drake 
kicks off for Arsenal in the league match against Villa wearing white shorts. Villa have brought in so much new talent that they are known as the Bank of England team, but they have yet to prove their sterling worth. Arsenal goes quickly ahead thanks to their centre forward Drake, who has apparently decided to win the match on his own. Continuing his display of brilliant opportunism, he plays ducks and drakes with the Villa defence. Villa's expensive experts are unavailing, and Drake scores at regular intervals, getting two more in the first half. To Villa's one, he gets seven, equaling the league record of 47 years standing. In 1936, Arsenal missed out on the league but still found success in the FA Cup. The semi-final against Grimsby was settled by Cliff Bastin's goal. The Gunners were back at Wembley yet again. The final itself was against another Yorkshire side, Sheffield United, but due to a dispute, no newsreel cameras were allowed inside the ground. Those not fortunate enough to be there had to be content with this very shaky aerial view of the match, not the best angle from which to see Ted Drake score the only goal. The cup was paraded around North London aboard an open-top bus the next day. There was good reason to cheer, and in 1938 it was followed by another league championship success, Arsenal's magnificent seventh trophy of the 1930s. There was no doubting the club's big box office status. Above all, boys, you must respect this amateur side. They're one of the finest amateur teams we've seen for years. They don't play your game, they play the attacking game. Ball goes up to Kirshen. He's racing on. He shoots, and a grand save. Corner against Trojan. Oi, Oi, don't keep blowing that whistle. Blow your nose down it. <laughs> Nearing the end of the first half now, and there's no score yet. Drake's onto it, over to Kirshen. This time it's a goal. First club to the Arsenal, 1-0. And about 30 seconds to go for half-time. Even in the movies, it finished 1-0 to the Arsenal. Sadly, though, the team's success was curtailed by the outbreak of the Second World War. Normal football was suspended as the country's young men were called up for military service. Arsenal's star players were no exception. However, there were still occasional matches, and in 1943, Arsenal reached the wartime cup final against Charlton Athletic. When the teams came out, I bet there were down few among the crowd of 75,000 who could have guessed a score of 7-1 for the Gunners. It was hard luck for Charlton that their first appearance at Wembley should have been the occasion for a record total of goals against them. There was a sixth goal and then a seventh, and this is Lewis scoring it. The Duke and Duchess of Gloucester were present, and the Duchess presented the cup to George Mayer. After the war, the nation's appetite for football was voracious. A seven-year stretch without competitive league and cup games had the fans flocking back to every ground in the country, and Highbury was no exception. But sadly, the war years had taken their toll on the golden gunners who dominated the 30s. Only a handful of the greats remained, and their talents had been diminished by the passage of time. George Allison remained in charge for the 1946-47 season, but the reins were then passed to another great servant of the club, Tom Whitaker, who'd been so instrumental in the triumphs of the 30s with both Allison and Chapman. He would now devise his own formula for success. Arsenal have paid over £30,000 for players since the war. This sounds an expensive policy, but I'm certain it has paid. We haven't lost a match in our first ten matches this season, and as long as we can keep on doing that, our turnstiles are going to click very regularly every match this season. Tom Whitaker was something of an awesome man. He was a big, powerful man, uh, very much uh, because I was the junior and he was the boss. Uh, you never really got close to Tom Whitaker, but uh, he was very impressive, very well respected. He really was a, a decent man, a good man. I'd like to introduce the team to you now. Wally Barnes, Ian McPherson, George Swindon, Laurie Scott, Jimmy Logie, Archie McCauley, Raymond Daniels, 
Lionel Smith, Leslie Compton, Dennis Compton, Ted Platt, Freddie Cox, <laughs> Reg Lewis, Don Roper, Dougie Lishman, Peter Goring, and our trainer, Billy Moon. Oi. Leading the line was striker Ronnie Rook, scorer of 69 goals in 93 games. It was special at the time because it had an enormous unity. They played as a team and they played for each other. There were a lot of characters then. Joe Mercer was certainly a, a great, great player. Leslie Compton and Dennis Compton knew them very well. To me, they're all stars. I, I've never, ever wanted to pick out stars of teams because I always think of them as individual people and uh, th there's some great chaps there. In Whitaker's first season in charge, Arsenal took the First Division Championship in some style, winning by a margin of seven points. Not so much a race as a procession. There were certainly a lot of people from Yorkshire as well as London who were dead keen on seeing Arsenal meet Leeds United at Highbury. When only eight clubs are left in the cup, Wembley is really on the horizon. As you see, Arsenal and Leeds supporters had their own ways of lending support. But there was still no score when Leeds kicked off in the second half, and the battle was still being fought out with determination by both teams. Then within ten minutes of resuming play, the ball came in from the left, and Lewis scored for Arsenal. As Arsenal helped themselves to another Wembley appearance, Captain Joe Mercer returned to his grocery store on Merseyside. In the days of the maximum wage, he needed another income, so commuted to London whilst keeping fit with Liverpool, ironically, Arsenal's 1950 FA Cup final opponents. Also in Liverpool, where he lives, is the Arsenal captain, Mercer. He too has been keeping in first-class trim, of course. The others, from whom Arsenal's cup team will be made up, are at Brighton. Golf, I need hardly mention, is only a sideline. They certainly mean to run as far and as fast as Liverpool at Wembley. The Gunners, indeed, are just as determined to win the Cup as their rivals in the North. Obviously, fitness and strong nerves, in addition to class football and real teamwork, will play a big part in victory for either side. Here we are, on the way to Wembley on the day, and what a day. The prospect was indeed a wet one. Really very bad luck on the tens of thousands crowding in to enjoy the tremendous thrills of a Cup final. Yes, sir, it's thirsty work, this watching. In fact, not much more than a quarter of an hour had passed when Arsenal forced a corner which Dennis Compton took. There's always a good chance from a corner, and soon a pass from Logie gave Lewis the very opportunity he wanted. Arsenal were one up. Well, that was the only score in the first half, and Royal Spectators, no less than the rest of the Wembley fans, waited to see if Liverpool could make a comeback in the second period. And within about 15 minutes, a centre from Cox was banged home by Lewis. Arsenal two up. Proper terrible, isn't it? Well, fancy that. Would you believe it? Anyway, Arsenal kept Liverpool out and won 2 naught. A great moment for their skipper as he went to receive the cup from the King. He gets the trophy, then for his medal. But there's some mistake. The King spots it and puts it right. Mercer was nearly given the wrong one. Typical scenes followed. Arsenal had last won the Cup in 1936. Now they had it again. And if you wonder how it feels to be the captain of a Cup-winning team, well... well... This is the greatest moment of my life to be holding the Cup here at Wembley. And while we're very, very pleased to have won it, I would like to say how wonderful Liverpool boys have been in their defeat. Two years later, and Arsenal were back at Wembley again. Newcastle were the opponents, and as had happened 20 years earlier, they had a huge slice of luck. In the days before substitutes, this injury to fullback Wally Barnes reduced Arsenal to 10 men for nearly an hour. They held out until six minutes from time, when Chilean George Robledo headed in off the post. For the supporters, it was sheer agony. Not for the first time, the Magpies had stolen the cup from Arsenal. The compensation was swift in coming, though. The championship was decided by goal average, and the margin of victory was a mere one-tenth of a goal. To paraphrase a popular politician of the era, never had so little meant so much to so many. Tragically, though, three years later, manager Tom Whitaker passed away. I remember very clearly the day he died. Everyone, he was very, very sad. 
Well, he was involved in everything, you see, and things were different then. Tom was the last of the secretary managers, so he was the ultimate boss. And after he died, Jack Crayston took over as, as uh, manager. After Tom Whitaker, the club turned to his assistant and former player Jack Crayston. But he never settled into the job, and after a disappointing 12th position in 1958, he was replaced by George Swindon. One of the legends of the late 30s and early 50s, former goalkeeper Swindon made a bright start, finishing third in his first season. But it wasn't sustained. I've always been uh, one of these people, I never thought a goalkeeper would make a good football manager, and, and George proved that. Um, Brian Greenwood, his assistant, was excellent coach, uh, excellent man management. He was his assistant and he was really the, the brains uh, behind the outfit. Arsenal have always been ahead of their times and in 1960, Doherty and his teammates turned to science to help them try and recapture former glories. Don't go all the way, Billy. Dennis Clapton's loose to the left of you. Joe Wood, ball, David, look up back. That's better. Come on, John, you can come in square. Johnny, now, hold and look, hold and look. I, I don't want to be unkind, but it was not the best period in the uh, club's history. As I said, we went for a long time without success. Over 47,000 turned up at Highbury, eager to bask in the hot sunshine and the joys of a new soccer season. For them, this was the big kickoff, and they were soon cheering away while the Gunners fought newly promoted Sheffield Wednesday. Mel Charles, number five, making his first appearance in Arsenal's league team was a big and expensive attraction. But it wasn't his or Arsenal's day. Perhaps it was too hot, it was in the upper 70s. Anyway, Wednesday won by the only goal in the match. We signed two or three good players, Scottish International. We signed, uh, I think it was uh, Jackie Henderson from Portsmouth. David Head was, was there, of course. Jimmy Bloomfield was a tremendous player and head forward as well. Uh, and uh, then Mel Charles, the younger brother of John Charles. But uh, it was a strange setup at that particular time because there was a lot of turmoil in the club on the playing side. Players started to leave, come, become unsettled and, and, and whatnot. And uh, we never really took off as a team. And as the sun comes out, Groves takes that throw for Arsenal to Bloomfield. Bloomfield, this delightful ball player, lovely body swerve. And hurt. And a goal! Corner to Arsenal being taken by their young centre forward, Strong, playing in his first league game. Comes up now to Vic Groves. Groves to Strong, he's got a shooting charge, he scores! He's got it! Wills with the throw again for Arsenal, getting it back from Doherty, noticeable that. Charles at centre forward for Arsenal, moving around a lot to try and get Fox away from the middle. Now Groves backing up. Groves changing his mind, it seemed then. Getting it to Charles. Costa Barnwell, a goal! <laughs> ah, it's Violet. Violet to young Charles, beaten brilliantly by Doherty, up to Barnwell. And Arsenal certainly playing some lovely football. Now it's up to Hurd. And Hurd tries one. He's a goal! Manchester's throw into Charlton. Momentarily unmarked. Can he hit it faster than ever? Fine save by Kelsey. Good, 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 good. One of Swindon's major signings was George Easton from Newcastle. He had every faith that Arsenal could turn the corner. You can never say Arsenal's in decline. Uh, while there's still an Arsenal, <laughs> there'll always be a chance of winning something. They're a top class club and always will be. The Eastham transfer became a test case for players' rights. At issue, freedom of contract and the chance to negotiate their own salaries. As a result, the maximum wage was abolished and the face of the game changed forever. It happened for everybody's benefit at the time. Players were allowed to earn a little more money than they had been doing or subjected to. Are you now proud of what you achieved for football? I think at the time I was then. I, I don't know what's happened now. It just seems to have gone beyond comprehension. It's, it's all too much to take in now. £100,000 a week. It's a lot of money. We used to get that in a career. 
Arsenal's importation from Italy, centre forward Joe Baker, is one reason why the Gunners may resume their former greatness. Another is manager Billy Wright, winner of 105 England caps and one of the best football brains of the time. Here he's watching Baker and his teammates preparing to put Arsenal on top of the soccer world. It's early days yet. Whether they'll succeed remains to be seen. Billy Wright was a lovely guy. I used to come with friends or family and he would be 30, 40 yards away in, in Highbury. And he would go out of his way to come and say, hello everybody, my name's Billy Wright. Everybody knew it was Billy Wright, but it was a lovely way he did it. He never assumed that. He was never cut out to be a football manager. I really don't think he was cut out to be a manager. I think some players you've got to get stuck into and be strong with them. I don't think he was. I think there would have been better players if he had been tough with them. He was a super player, uh, absolutely first-class person, lovely man, but he just really wasn't cut out for being a manager of a football club. England international Joe Baker's arrival from Torino embellished Billy Wright's already attack-minded side. The likes of Jeff Strong, George Eastham and George Armstrong conceded plenty and relied on scoring more. They may not have been successful, but there was hardly ever a dull moment. That's a beautiful ball to Armstrong. It's Baker. And it's a goal. Baker has it wide. Oh, what a beautiful goal. Glorious goal by Baker. In those days, clubs scored a lot of goals. There was no shortage of goals, let's put it that way. We maybe scored 70, 80, 100. You beat a man, you had a chance to score a goal. This is Baker for Arsenal. Armstrong, outside left. Up comes Easter, and he scores! Baker, big ball to Strong. Out to Anderson. Strong again. Easton, it's good return, a fine move and a lovely goal by Strong. A lovely goal. Armstrong, Easton close to him. Armstrong and the goal, an equaliser by Baker. Up comes Story, the left back. Scott moving in, and he scored. Baker. Baker to Samuels, and Arsenal is spiked as ever in his Armstrong. He's going to be number five. Yes. They could score goals so easily. But the trouble was they'd score three and they'd let in four. They'd score two, they'd let in three. And it always needs to be the other way round. It was absolutely unbelievable. Joe and I used to be really crushing them in and they were flying back the other way. We used to beat, you know, the real top teams. We used to beat loads of them and get beat off lower teams. It was incredible. Four, three, five, four, four each. We had a lot of titanic struggles in those days. It was down to all of us, myself included. Uh, we didn't apply ourselves enough. And looking back, we should probably have taken um, a lot more responsibility. Arsenal's finishes under Wright became progressively poorer. However, his contribution shouldn't be dismissed. He built a team that contained several players who were to have a huge influence on the club in the next few years. This lineup from 1965 proved that Billy had laid the foundations for the rebirth of Arsenal. Some very good players came through and I think that was the basis of the double team, which was, I suppose, a bit unlucky for Billy. Although his record was poor as regards winning things, you know, he didn't win anything, the fact is that he laid the basis for a side that developed in the late 60s and the early 70s that over a period of six seasons came first or second and virtually every member of that squad was brought to this club by Billy Wright. Well, we all received letters in the closed season saying that Billy Wright and Les Shannon, that their appointments had been relinquished. We weren't surprised that Billy had gone and um, we were surprised that they made an initial appointment of Bertie Mee. Typical of the Arsenal, there was names from all over the world uh, who were going to come and take that job. And uh, all of a sudden, Bertie got the job, and of course we all went, oh, I don't know, whoa, this is unusual. Well, we, we couldn't believe it. I mean, Bertie was a little, um, what's the word for it? Sort of a pompous little man, you know, and called you 
Okay, McClintock and that, that sort of stuff. It's a bit like that, like, like Dad's Army type of thing. But even as a physio, he, he, he ruled that dressing room and that treatment room like a staff sergeant in the army. You know, I mean, he would bring you in at nine o'clock in the morning for treatment. If you had a sore foot, you would exercise every single muscle in your body about 500 times before lunchtime. Then he would give you an hour off and then he would bring you back again and do the same. And then he would let you go straight into the heavy traffic at five o'clock at night. So that in the future, you didn't really want to get injured again. He was here as the physio and it was felt that maybe this was the man that uh, perhaps could get a grip of the team and get a grip of the playing staff entirely and lead us uh, on, and he did, of course. I think the players, they responded to him as well. They responded to his discipline. They responded to him wanting things for, to be done properly. We realised we couldn't step out of line, uh, whether it be almost anything, certainly dress code. You know, he would have us in our ties and our jackets and, and the, gold, the gold gun was on there. And my goodness, you felt everywhere you went, you felt proud to be wearing this. And, and it, we blossomed. Bertie's appointment of Dave Sexton as coach was a big step in the right direction. He revolutionised training and the players began to perform. Dave Sexton um, was just what the club needed at the time because the club was a little bit low. And Dave came in with a lot of fantastic ideas, training ideas, very enthusiastic used to go over on a Sunday after our Saturday game to watch teams like Inter Milan and AC Milan, go over there on the Sunday, watch the games, watch, perhaps watch training sessions, come back with a lot of new ideas. Still Samuels and he's got a bang on him! Oh, magnificent goal! John Samuels! His first goal of the season! And Dave Sexton was absolutely brilliant for uh, forwards, possibly not as uh, talented with the defence. You'd sort of work half an hour with the defence and like six hours with the forwards under Dave. George Graham. That's aimed towards Radford. Up he goes! Oh, Radford! My goodness, what a leap! And then Dave left, went off to Chelsea, and Bertie gave me the job. But he gave me my freedom to work with the players. Don, from day one, got stuck in there. He's a guy who, who literally, um, if you've played well, he will grab you and hug you and... He will make you realise that you've contributed. If he thinks you've underachieved, he will be in your face. I mean, many a time I've wiped, wiped away spittle from my face and I have been back in his face saying, oh, you know, I mean, literally vicious, but never with anything other than respect for each other. Oh, Don was brilliant. I thought Don was superb. Um, you know, he was my next door neighbour, but we nearly came to blows many a time at, at meetings in the Monday morning or on half time on a Saturday. And, you know, no holds were barred. Mee's first two seasons in charge ended in comfortable top ten finishes. The team continued to evolve with George Graham arriving from Chelsea and Bob McNabb from Huddersfield Town, two important additions to the squad as Arsenal reached the 1968 League Cup final. Arsenal kick off in the second League Cup final to be held at Wembley. Arsenal with seven league championships to their credit against Leeds. Leeds have already been so near to winning the League Cup as well as the FA and the Fairs Cups as well. Arsenal's John Radford, seven, and David Jenkins, eight, soon to be frustrated. Up to now, frustration has played a major part in the Leeds story. Then a corner taken by Gray. It headed out, but straight to Cooper, who put it hard and fast into the back of Fernell's net. The chance for redemption came swiftly, as 12 months later they were red-hot favourites to beat 3rd Division Swindon Town in the 1969 final. I remember the first, the, the week prior to that, I think three-quarters of the lads went down with this virus, we had a flu bug or something at the uh, team. I, amongst others, got out of my bed on Thursday to play the game on the Saturday. We went to the Wembley to, to look at the pitch on the Friday, and we thought, oh, this is never going to be played because it was torrential rain and there was all planks all over the Wembley pitch. And um, we thought, oh, it's never going to be played. It's just, it was a bog. We just, we were just dead that day. Didn't really play. Pitch was terrible, it was heavy. Worst thing that we, could have happened, like, you know, when you've all been struggling for a week or so. What a terrible mistake by Arsenal! Graham, now cooled off in support. 
Can Kuhl get to it now? It's a goal by Kuhl! And my goodness, is he not pleased with life? Bobby Kuhl! And they are really happy, he's crying! Bobby Kuhl is crying! Then we went into Rectotron, which was the last thing we really wanted. And, and to be fair to Swindon, yeah, they outplayed us an extra time. And you'd have to say, deservedly went on to win the game 3-1. It was a nightmare. And all the headlines now, I remember the shame of London. That's when we really showed the backbone. Out of that came the side that the following year won the Fairs Cup. The worst thing of all was that the, the last triumph at this club prior to our era was 1953. We were always being reminded of the, the great teams of the 30s and the 50s, quite rightly, I mean, they, they, they were very successful. There was these photographs on the wall of people like Joe Mercer and the Comptons, and when the club were winning things in those days, and people said, oh, you want to get rid of all those, uh, those old photographs, uh, you know, it, it's putting people off, it's putting the players off, and I went, no, 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 hang on. I said, we have to replace these photographs and we have to replace it with these players here with a cup in their hands so they can go there and that'll be a pain in the backside for the next group. So that's what we did. So 1969-70 was to be the season to end the long wait for a trophy. And new to the team that year was a local lad who'd been just two years old when Arsenal had last enjoyed success. People used to say I was a rebel without a cause. I don't know, I might have been, I honestly don't know. I started off with a short haircut with a skinhead. People never used to say, oh, look, he's a skinhead. And I think when you're young, you're a bit rebellious. If someone told me to do something, I would go the opposite way. And I'd just let my hair grow and grow and grow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, everyone was more worried about me hair than me, me, me playing ability. Now Robertson. To George. And it's high. Quite a shot on him, 18 years old. As Charlie's hair grew and colour television spread, so did Arsenal's reputation, especially after impressive performances like this in the European Fairs Cup. McNabb. Radford. <laughs> Wonderfully well taken goal. Simpson again. Robertson, Arsenal moving with real authority and looking very composed. What a good header and what a good goal! Graham! Armstrong, Radford, McNabb, yes! Graham! They had this resolve. They got round each other. They wanted to win. They made their mind up. They wanted to win something. All they needed was guidance. So that's what we did. And we broke through because we won the first cup, as it was called, and it's the UEFA Cup now. And we beat Anderlecht in the final, which was difficult. We were 3-0 we were down over in Anderlecht. There were a lad called Muller up front. He was absolutely brilliant. He tore us to pieces. And it could have been maybe four or five out there. I think Ray came on late as a substitute and grabbed a goal. I mean, that, that was our lifeline, really. I mean, we all came in, to be honest, heads down and this and the other. They give us a the right pasting, to be fair. And really, the only one to, who picked us up, really, was Frank. No one at the end of the game, I said, get your heads up, we'll win this game, just keep it tight at the back, get the ball out wide, get the crosses in and we'll do them. And that's exactly what happened. And Armstrong with the kick. McClintock to Kelly. Made a little space for himself there, Kelly. And a bit more there as well. And a goal by Kelly! The Red Trafford here standing! George Graham to Bob McNabb right up. Can he turn it back? A good cross there from McNabb! Probably the greatest, greatest night ever at Highbury. 55, 56,000 in the ground. It was an extraordinary night. It was the first time we'd won for 17 years, and it was so important to us as a team. At last, we had won something. We felt as though that gave us a confidence. And that's what happens with a lot of teams. They need a win behind them, a cup or something, and then they can go on from there.
the confidence then for the following season, we were just we just believed in in each other so much. There was a tremendous tremendous camaraderie, and we just thought that we could beat anybody and everybody. Story. Kennedy going in. Redford. That's a good ball from Graham. He's got three on the far post. One coming across the nearest Kennedy. Rice. Kennedy. Perfectly placed by Rice. Perfectly taken by Kennedy. We had a good squad, you know. We, we never had great individuals, but collectively of a team, whatever we did, we did together. And that was the strongest point of the team. The camaraderie among the players was first class. And uh, I think the, the outstanding coaching and the man management of both Don and Bertie Mee, that really added to the total picture. The determination and the, the ability to win a game, and once we were one nothing up, you could forget about it. You could go and get your fish and chips, your cup of tea, get on your bike, get home, because we would never gave a game away that I can remember once we were one nothing up, that was it. Arsenal get their second corner of the game. Oh, it's a good one. And hooked away by George. And it must be McClintock. Got to be McClintock. Graham at the far side there, giving him his head. There it is, George Graham. Armstrong coming in on it. Beautifully played there by Armstrong. Oh, and a dummy there, let's it. Armstrong with the throw. Kennedy. Graham and Radford are there. They're scoring. A good goal. Armstrong to take the corner. It's a good header. It's there, Graham. Radford. Armstrong, Radford. Yes, Kennedy! Now for Armstrong. That penalty area is so crowded. And Radford going in. And Kelly! Kelly has done it! Arsenal were tantalisingly close to the title. The only task left was to avoid a defeat or a score draw in their final game against Spurs. And we played Tottenham at Tottenham, naturally our big rivals. There was 40,000 at least locked out that night, and I think there was close to 50 or 60,000 at Tottenham. I mean, it was massive crowd. I mean, it was an extraordinary pressure, and, and you were playing a club that were not only your biggest, fiercest rivals and remain so in... in local terms, but the only club that had achieved the double in that century. It was like a cup final, really, but uh, the, the, the feeling was unbelievable. And, um, you know, to, to win there 1-0, and Big Ray got a great header. I mean, everybody said, well, did Tottenham lie down? They didn't lie down. I mean, they, they were at us right up to the final whistle. After the match, we were in the dressing room, and the commissioner came in and said, Mr Me, they would like you to go on to the pitch. So I said to Bertie, I said, Bertie, look, I've just come in. I wouldn't go near it. And he turned to me and he pulled himself up to his whole five foot six height and said, young man, there is a time in one's career when one thinks of others. Well, off he went and 20 minutes later he came back and his shirt and tie had gone, his jacket was ripped. And he said, they're mad, <laughs> using all the expletives in the world, which was so unlike Bertie, but uh, no, there's some nice days there. Yes, nice days. That was a great night. I loved that night. I was aware of it all and, you know, and we all went to the pub afterwards. I know the modern day players go and drink two bottles of uh, water, but we drank about two gallon of beer. And then only five days later, we were asked to do what no other club had done and then go to Wembley and, and win the FA Cup final against Liverpool. The 8th of May 1971, and only Liverpool and the stifling heat stood between this Arsenal side and immortality. Not even Chapman had claimed the double, they were fighting against the odds. They made Liverpool favourites, the bookies. I had my biggest bet then, I had a five on us to win it. <laughs> well, Don and Bertie actually says, look lads, we've won what we wanted to win. 
you know, we obviously we want to win the cup final as well, but you know, we've won it, we've won the championship. Go and enjoy yourself, you know. And McClintock winning that one well in the air. George Graham, a nice little touch off there for Charlie George. And he let that one go. He really does strike those balls beautifully. We slaughtered him. I mean, the, the, you know, when you look, I've watched the game a couple of times, I got the video at home. It could have been 4 0, 5 0. I mean, they had one cleared off the line, I think. We had one cleared off the line. But after that, we made like three, four real clear cut chances. I mean, it, it, we should have murdered them. McNabb and now Radford. All trying to lift that over Smith's head. He lifts it forward for Kennedy. Oh, what a miss! That was some fine work there as uh, Kennedy applauding his fellow striker Radford. And now the corner. in terrible trouble until Larry Lloyd finally gets it away from Graham's header. But I thought we were fitter than Liverpool. And we got people, young people like uh, Eddie Kelly and one or two of them, and, and they just needed stimulating at the end of the game. There was no like, come on, lads, you can do it. It was like, hey, you come on. You, em I can remember Emily News, uh, who plays for, for Liverpool that day. He, he'd gone. The heat had done him. And Chris was saying to Eddie, go on, get on your bike, get in the box, go on, go on, go on. Still highway, dangerous indeed! Oh, a goal! Oh, that's the goal! Steve Highway for Liverpool! Wilson came away from that near post, and Highway found the gap. We went a goal down and Bob Wilson anticipated a cross. I thought I'd get that in. <laughs> I contrived to get my angles wrong and give Liverpool the lead, uh, courtesy of Steve Highway's goal. Um, but it was meant to be. We, we again showed just what an extraordinary team we were. Frank McClintock, best captain I ever, ever played with. An impulsive guy, and it was his impulsive nature that hauled us up off the ground, as it were. Oh, I just gave him a dirty look. I think he keeps on saying that I slagged him off or something, but we had great respect for Bobby. He was as brave as a lion. He really was. George and Kennedy again. Radford. Back over his head, Kelly is right in there, playing much more as a striker in this extra time. And it's there! George Graham! It's George Graham who got the touch and makes it 1-1! Well, George Graham claimed it, but the more I keep looking at the video, he's got a guilty look on his face. <laughs> he knew. <laughs> Now, I thought that the first Arsenal goal was scored by George Graham, and so do did practically every journalist in the press box. We can show you now that, in fact, it was scored by Eddie Kelly. I thought I got a touch at the time, I thought it brushed my, it brushed my leg, but everybody else thought it because the anticipation of all the, the opposition Liverpool players, uh, you could see that everybody thought it was me, you know. But uh, the important thing was we went on to win it and uh, complete the double. Graham, Radford, Charlie George. Radford. Oh, Charlie George, you can hit him! Ray Clements had a goal kick, and within about five seconds, I think the ball's in the back of the net. And for me, anywhere around 20, 30 yards, strikeable for me. As soon as it left my foot, I knew it was a goal. Well, the celebration was immortal, but didn't I kill some time? I was too far ahead of my time. You know, people are going, I must have laid on the floor for a half hour. Must have took the whole of extra time up. me five times before I actually won it and when I did win it I was so knackered that I didn't even enjoy it. I would played 66 competitive matches that year, never was substituted once, plus I played six pre-season friendlies as well, so it was 72 games and I used to shout and ball during a game and it used to be 60 odd thousand people here every game. Well done, pat them on the back, kick them up the backside, maybe try and change tactics. So, you're expending an awful lot of energy all the time through the games and that, you know, and I was like an empty shell, going up to pick that cup up. It should have been the greatest moment of my life, and yet I was so tired I didn't enjoy it as much as I should have done. What a smile. From His Royal Highness, the Duke of Kent, 
The cup goes to Frank McClintock and the Arsenal. Dr. Stephen, the chairman of the FA. The Royal Highness, the Duchess of Kent. And there it is for that wonderful crowd of Arsenal. People have never said we were a great footballing side. They've never accepted that our 70-71 side, and even I have had to say, even though we scored great goals, um, we weren't loved like, say, uh, or looked upon with the beauty, say, of the Tottenham side or the Arsene Wenger side of 2002, the double winning side there. But if you're talking about great teams, the perfect jigsaw of rough edges and smooth edges, we fitted like that. We were absolutely the perfect jigsaw. But it was about to lose one of its most significant pieces. Rated as the best coach in Europe, Don Howe was in demand, and the offer of the manager's job at West Brom tempted him away. I was very ambitious, and I don't think anybody would say, well, that was wrong. I really should be ambitious for the Arsenal Football Club again. Everything come, like I said, so quickly. The success comes so quickly. I, I didn't realise enough what a good team we'd got and we had got a very good team. I think back to, to my career at the Arsenal, and I think there's been times when I left when I should have stayed, because I've been there three times on and off, and there's times when I stayed when I should have left. I know that now, and don't ask me the story. I know that now, but I can't take it back. And that time, the double time, that was one of the times when I left when I should have stayed because there was a lot more in that team. Steve Buttonshaw took over and did a good job. He's a good coach, Steve, but Don really had his... You know, very tough he was in that, you know? And I think we needed that uh, the following year as well because some players can get a little bit lax and think they've done it. And the, the secret of getting and winning the double was the hard work and the dedication that we put in every single game. And sometimes after we won the double, that didn't happen, you know? There was still plenty of cause for optimism, though, not least with the signing of World Cup winner Alan Ball during the 71-72 season. Bob Wilson. Kennedy. Story. Bradford Kennedy moving to his left. Corner, Armstrong. Oh, what a shot from John Roberts! John Roberts! That's 1 0 Arsenal. John Roberts, the scorer. Kennedy following it up quickly. And George Graham in there. A lovely one, too, with Armstrong. Graham again. And a goal! George Graham through the legs of Harvey. But a magnificent one, too. A magnificent one, too, by Arsenal. Rice. Hitting a good one! Oh, a great goal! Pat Rice! Armstrong. Graham. A hard one across. Charlie George! Oh, and he's done it! On the stroke of half time! Charlie George! I personally believe that we could have possibly done the double the following year. Uh, but for us to say one reason or another, it, it didn't work out. Um, you know, but uh, the, the quality was actually there. That side should have won more trophies than they actually did. Jones now for Leeds. And McNabb only half stopping him. Jones getting it across. And Clark going in. And Alan Clark has put Leeds ahead. In 1973, the title provided the main challenge as the Gunners moved into top spot following this win over closest rivals Liverpool. the target and he's got it he's got two against one Kennedy's there and now he's by himself Clements right out and that is 2-0 but Arsenal couldn't sustain the challenge and a disappointing run-in left them three points adrift of champions Liverpool the collapse was to signal a breakup of the great double winning side we nearly did it again you know but we didn't do it and um, and then Bertie Mee thought I was getting too old and um, he, he let me go, which broke my heart at the time. I think the team was broke up too early. The team should have been together for at least another three or four years because it was capable of winning things, that is for sure. The manager decided to break it up, brought in a couple of players, but uh, that team should, in my opinion, should never have been broken up too soon. 
Bertie Mee tried to build a new team with a mixture of young, eager players and cut-price signings, but a consistent winning formula proved elusive. And story up there. Now Brady, chance to cross in towards Kip, played back for Armstrong. Oh, hit now, ball! Yes, Good running by Kelly, and a good shot, what a tremendous goal that was! And Brady taking the kick. Come out to Nelson, deflection and cleared off the line by Ingham, and now it's been put in, and I think it's young Rostron again. Yes, it is. Chipped in once more, Oscar in trouble, Kim! Obviously, we welcomed the chance, you know. We wanted the opportunity to show what we could do. But on the other hand, I think it probably happened too quickly and um, and too many good players left. I think that we were going through an indifferent period then. You know, you, you was, um, there were some old players, there were some, there were some players on the actual brink of, of coming into the first team. Um, you know, so I, don't, I, don't, I honestly don't think personally that it was, that it was down to Bertie May, no. The general feeling was that Bertie had sort of done his time here and, and it's a very stressful job and I think it was felt that he'd got to a certain age when it would be better if he retired and we pensioned him off. I hope the parting was amicable and um, we saw a lot of Bertie after that. Me had reawakened the club from ten years of torpor and made Arsenal successful once more. However, 17th position was too close to relegation for comfort and the next appointment would be crucial. Despite having previously managed Spurs, Terry Neal was Arsenal through and through. He knew the traditions of the club as well as anyone. The phone call came again. Uh, which I couldn't resist, obviously, because um, Dennis Hill Wood, the old chairman, had been like the second father to me at Highbury. He knew his football, but he used to play the old duffer. He said, oh, I'm just the old duffer, doesn't know anything about it. You're the expert, get on with it. In an attempt to recapture the glory days, he pulled off one of the most audacious transfers of the decade. Malcolm McDonald, or Super Mac, had been almost deified on Tyneside, yet Neil persuaded him to come to Highbury. Took him down to see the old man which is always a clincher, down in Hampshire. And, in fact, he got on so well with the chairman, neither Malcolm nor I could really totally remember the terms that we thrashed out. Thank God Ken Fryer was around. I saw Arsenal as the team uh, that would dominate the late 70s, and I wanted to be a part of it. And again he did well. McDonald's! Brady again with the corner. That looked like a push to me. Hudson with a header. McDonald with a header. And they've got that two goal lead again. McDonald the scorer. It's come to Alan Ball. McDonald getting up. That's the one he wanted. And how well he put it away. Stapleton's on the far side, so is McDonald. Stapleton, McDonald's! Armstrong, Matthews is the player in the middle. Had to check to stop being offside, here comes Ross. Stapleton on the near post. McDonald's! Seems to write a football story is better than boys' fiction. Has gone and done it all over again. The club itself and the supporters, they just got into my blood. I loved it because it was such a professional outfit. The whole thing, everything from the very top with the chairman, St. Dennis Hillwood, filtering all the way down through everybody, down to the, to the tea lady. Everybody had their job and they did their utmost to do it brilliantly. Not just well, but brilliantly. And you just felt honour bound to go and reward in every kick, every tackle, every challenge in the game. You just felt you had to do your 
absolute best at all times. In Neil's first season, Arsenal finished in eighth position, and although this was an improvement for the Gunners, the manager decided he needed help on the training pitch. So the prodigal coach, Don Howe, returned to Highbury. Both our wives thought for many years that we just should have moved in together and got married. We'd be working around the training ground all day, and as soon as we get home, I'm in the study on the phone ringing Dawn, and my wife Sandra saying, but you've been with them all day. Working with Teddy again was good. He's always got a smile on his face. He's always got a few words for you, and they were always Irish words. And uh, he was good to work with. And here again, he, he was uh, he's a little bit Bert, like Bertie in terms that he let me do the job. They were a great partnership, him and Don Hale. They, uh, I don't think Don could do his job, and I don't you know, I think Terry could do Don's job, so it was a good partnership. The best thing he did was he went and he got Don Howe back from Leeds. And uh, so we then started all over again with a completely new batch of players. That was Brady's pass, and a beauty it was too to Sunderland. Stapleton on the far post. Sunderland shots. Oh, it's in. He scored again. Divine. And a great header and a great goal by Price. That really was a beautiful goal. Nelson. and needing to get a goal to whip themselves up into action. By Willie Young. Went in for O'Leary. Price is right in there, and Stapleton's right in there. And what a goal! Frank Stapleton was beginning to mature into a really fine centre-forward. Graham Ricks, a very good left-sided midfield player. At the back, Terry brought Pat Jennings in, who was a legendary Arsenal goalkeeper as well. He played nearly 10 years for the club, and uh, he was outstanding. David O'Leary, a uh, world-class centre-back. Uh, he was only 19, 20 at the time, so... Uh, we really were a, a fine, up-and-coming young side. And the linchpin was a Dublin-born genius, who remains one of the greatest players ever to appear for Arsenal. Liam Brady is the most deceptive footballer. Price, McDonald, Brady! A brilliant goal by a brilliant player. People to this day still remember him for his wonderful left foot. Oh, what a goal! He wasn't just a skillful player, he was a great all-round player. Brady tried to get in there, might still get in there, Brady! That's a beautiful goal! Wonderful uh, imagination for a footballer. Lovely playmaker. Wonderful things he did with his left foot. He could knock it all over the pitch. He could go up to people and beat people. I mean, these days, you're talking about these. Do you ever see a midfield player who can dribble like Liam Brady? No! We used to give the ball to Liam Brady on the penalty area. And the rest of us then used to sort of just amble our way upfield, not worry about the ball have a little chat as we were making our way upfield. And we all used to congregate on the edge of the penalty area on the far post because we knew the cross was going to come in. He was absolutely phenomenal. Remember that goal at Tottenham? That one goal is good. He, he picks up the ball and he goes here, there, there, and he bends it and sticks it right in the top corner. Oh, Brady won it beautifully. It's been remembered the best part of a quarter of a century as a, as a very good goal, and they show it time and time again. So it's, it's nice to be remembered in that fashion. Howe's arrival brought immediate dividends, as in 1978, Arsenal stormed to the FA Cup final, brushing away Orient effortlessly in the semi-final. Weiss going in, now McDonald deflected again! This time it's Ricks taking men on, and this is where Orient looks so vulnerable. And it's gone under Jackson, and it's three to the delight of Graham Ricks. And that's the moment when they can see Wembley for sure.
The first trophy for the new regime looked a formality on paper, but an inspired Ipswich town defied the odds. Does Arsenal get us away this 1978 FA Cup final? I was still learning. I actually made mistakes. There were one or two players that weren't fully fit, and maybe I should have been a little more ruthless. I don't want to take anything away from them and Bobby Robson, who was a big mate of mine, and they deserved to win in the game, but we were knackered. We were definitely running on empty, as they say. They only won 1-0, but it could have been five. They were that good that day. So hats off to them. Well done, Bobby Robson. There were brickbats aplenty for Arsenal after that cup final, but in the following season's third round tie at Sheffield Wednesday, it was snowballs that Pat Jennings had to avoid. Over the years, I mean, as a goalkeeper, you get hit with everything, like from door hands, the snooker balls, the bottles, uh, darts even. Uh, so, I mean, the snowballs, it was just a distraction on the day, but at least it didn't hurt all that much. In the days before penalty shootouts in the FA Cup, Wednesday took Arsenal to an incredible five games. And there were other tricky ties en route to Wembley that year, not least a fifth-round match at Champions Nottingham Forest. Stapleton and Sunderland just outside the six-yard box. And that is a beauty by Stapleton! Shilton never moved to it. Price won it well, Stapleton. So, Arsenal were back at Wembley with a chance to redeem themselves. A big day out for a big club. Look at him, what a beautiful, what a beautiful, joyful face there. Absolutely magnificent. I hope it's his first time he's been here, actually, because it is portraying so much pleasure from it that uh, your first time is always the best. I think we had a slight advantage having been there the year before and losing that we knew what it was all about. We didn't get carried away with the hype of the cup final that year. We were more focused and uh, I think we won because of that. Sunderland is again good timing getting it in the air. Now Brady with Makari snapping at him. I wonder if that's going to be the sort of thing we shall see for 90 minutes that Makari will need to stick close to Brady when he's in the midfield there. Price going right in there and turning it back. I honestly think uh, that I made the final touch. I came in to the ball, which was cut back, I think, from David Price. And me and Sunday come in with Martin Bucken. But I've obviously got pictures to prove my foot was on the ball. I think Sunday would have been a bit more wanting to claim if he hadn't got the winner. The winner was much more important. <laughs> it won the cup. So Sunday was happy to take the win, and I took the first one. Here's Brady. Going all the way, can he find the shot or the cross? There's the little cross coming in, and that's number two by Stapleton. We were cruising at 2-0. We'd really dominated the game. We, we were in control, we were playing well, and all of a sudden, Man United got a lifeline. Koppel lifts that free kick in there again. It'll come all the way through to Jordan, turning it back in there again, and a goal! And it's good up. And McQueen is the man who claims it. And suddenly, United are back in the game with four minutes left, and who knows what might be produced in those four minutes. They got a goal back, and we so we're still all right. And then, I mean, Sammy McElroy came through, and to this day, I, I, I thought I was getting there. And he just got a, a total in underneath me, and that was two each. I mean, you can imagine the headlines. You could see the headlines the next day. Arsenal blowing it like. I often get asked, even these days, how did you feel? Well, what a stupid question to ask anyone. I'm still waiting for Manchester United to beat us. What I truthfully thought, if this goes into extra time, they will beat us. Friends of mine were was, was saying to me they never seen our third goal because they had their head buried in their hands. They thought, we've, you know, we're blowing it. Well, wait a moment. It's there! Once more, 
what an amazing cup final. Well, that's when you're at your most vulnerable, when suddenly you've got it all back. They relax for a moment, and Arsenal have punished them for it. From having the cup with both hands on it, really nearly, we had a, a hand taken off it, and then all of a sudden we had both hands back on it. So it, it changed within a, five minutes, the game. I think was a relief. Uh, you know, we just sagged at the end of it all. It was, uh, it was so emotional and so near to getting it, and yet it was slipping away from us. So it, it uh, was another day to remember. Three seasons now as the captain, and the proudest moment in his career because Arsenal make up for last year's defeat and take the cup to Highbury. We bring Alan Sunderland, who uh, gave us that tremendous climax. Alan, yeah. have you got any breath to describe that winning goal? Well, I can't remember much about it. I think Rixie beat beat somebody on the left, didn't you, Rixie? Rixie? Hello. You beat you beat somebody on the talk, left. Didn't talk you? us through the winning goal. I can't remember. I know. I just hit it over. I'm a bit tired, and uh, and I just come round the just back. Just stuck it in. And I thought, uh, uh, Arthur Alberson, we're going to get a touch to it, like, but he, he, he just come beyond him, and I just got my foot. I can't remember how that happened. Not kidding. I've got to say this: sometimes fate comes into it, uh, and sometimes luck does come into football. For all the skills and all the great players, we all need a little bit of luck at the right time. Arsenal were rapidly gaining a reputation for being particularly adept in the cup competitions. This win over Gothenburg in the 1980 Cup Winners' Cup set up a semi-final tie against Juventus. Their only problem now was fitting all the games into the schedule. Now, Juventus had had 10 days off. Our Easter programme was Southampton at home on the Saturday, Spurs away in the Monday afternoon, Juventus in the first leg, the Cup Winners' Cup um, on the Wednesday, and Liverpool at Hillsborough, FA Cup semi-final on the Saturday. I mean, they, they talk these days about pressure of games and everything like that. We just seem to be on a plane or a coach all season. The first leg at Highbury saw Juventus take the lead and score a vital away goal through Cabrini. Then an own goal equaliser from the head of Roberto Bettega gave Arsenal a glimmer of hope. But the return leg in Turin still looked daunting. It's an unbelievable night that. I think they were happy to just see the game play it out for the 90 minutes and go through on their way goal. And of course, Vassen liked the goal for us in the last few minutes of the match. And we walked past the, the Juventus dressing room, and there wasn't a sound coming from the dressing room. We were just devastated. That was one of the greatest victories in Arsenal's history, and we deserved it on the night. You know, I don't think Juventus had lost a European tie for many, many, many years in Turin. There was no basking in the glory of Turin, though, as Arsenal faced up to an FA Cup semi-final with all-conquering Liverpool. It proved to be an epic, needing three replays. I think those four games were probably one of the greatest adverts for English football. Great teams, great players, hardly a whisker in it. It was finally decided at Highfield Road at Coventry, and I came in from 12 yards and just headed it down and went in the corner of the net. And that turned out to be the winning goal. But at the moment, it's Pat Rice for Arsenal. Played on nicely here again for Arsenal, but Ray Kennedy that time coming to stop Stableland, but Stableland got a second chance. Torbert coming in! And Arsenal are in the lead with Brian Torbert. And that's a good break forward by Phil Neal. And it might work for them. Dalglish with a shot. Oh, off the legs of Jennings. And Sunis tried to turn it in, and somehow Jennings retrieved it again. Liverpool's double is finished because Arsenal have won and go through to Wembley to meet West Ham on Saturday week. You think you've done the hard bit then, but what we didn't realise, the hard bit was still to come. Those semi-finals against Liverpool taken lots and lots out of us. I think by the time we got rid of Liverpool, it was instead of a month's preparation for the final, it was about ten days. And uh, lots of games and uh, West Ham, sunny. We turned up, we didn't play. 
and uh, quite rightly they deserve to win it in a scrappy poor game. Drained by their exertions, the defeat by West Ham was a bitter and unexpected blow. Now the side had just four days to regroup before the Cup Winners' Cup final against Valencia. We went to Brussels and thinking, OK, let's make up for a disappointment at the Cup final. I felt as though we did enough to actually win that. You know, uh, uh, we went at them more than they went at us. That's Karate following up. And Karate left his foot there a little bit. You could see the reaction of Sammy Nelson. Now, Karate was first in with the foot there. And I think the referee may feel he's overreacting to the alleged retaliation because these Spaniards are regarded as very good actors. But I think if there was anybody going to score in normal time, it was going to be us. I think we were still the team that were taking, we were taking the game to the other team. Brady shot! Oh, he saved it! I think both teams cancelled each other out and there was not a lot of chances in the game. And it looked like it was going to be a, a nil-nil ball, uh, so we have to go to penalties. And the people who you think, well, he'll score and he'll score, but he won. It was the opposite way around with us. And it's Mario Kempis, the man who won the World Cup for Argentina, against Pat Jennings, the man who saved so many matches for Arsenal. You couldn't ask for two greater protagonists with which to start this unique competition. And Pat saved it! Oh, Pat Jennings is saved from Kempis! I saved the first one from Kempis, and then, of course, you know, you think, well, first, it's a good start. All we've got to do now is score, but I mean, penalties never really work out that way, do they? Brady against Pereira. Oh, and he saved it as well! Goodness me! We're back to square one again! It lives with me to this day, you know, if only had I gone to the other side. I think what the keeper did that evening was decide to go to his left every time. And the law of averages was that he was going to guess that one of them went there. This is sudden death now. It's a question of each side taking one until somebody misses with the even number of kicks taken. Arias. Oh, it just went in underneath Pat Jennings, I think. There are one or two of them, actually, who uh, don't really want to watch this. But now Ricks. Oh, he saved it! And Valencia have won the Cup Winners' Cup because Graham Ricks' penalty was saved by Carlos Pereira. And the Valencia players go wild with delight. We lost it, so I'm just as much to blame as the people who took the penalties and didn't score, you know, because we were all part of the team, and what we say is there's no I in team. You know, we're all in it together. We ended up playing 70 games that season. Magnificent season. We ended up winning nothing. I think by the time the West Ham game came around and the Valencia game a few days later, we just lost our edge. So that's my excuse, and I'm sticking by it. I signed during the pre-season for Juventus one evening in London. Away I went, very, very sad day to leave Arsenal. And uh, Frank Stapleton left quickly after me as well. From that day, you thought to yourself, well, is this the breakup of it all? You know, because really and truthfully, who knows if that team had been kept together, what else might that team have won? The other transfer activity of 1980 was frantic, to say the least. Just weeks after signing Clive Allen from Queen's Park Rangers, Terry Neal swapped him for Crystal Palace's Kenny Sansom. If I had a pound for every time I got asked that question, what happened with you and Clive Allen? I said, I don't really know. There's one rumour that I heard that Terry Venables was at QPR and he had a fallout with Jim Gregory, who was the chairman at Queen's Park Rangers, and went to Crystal Palace. And Jim vowed never to sell a player from Queen's Park Rangers to Crystal Palace. So the deal went, instead of that, Clive went to Arsenal and then, boom. That's the only story, but you'll have to ask Terry Venables or Terry Neal, they might know the answer. We didn't concoct anything, it was just straightforward. I had Sammy Nelson, who had been troubled for quite a while with a bit of a knee injury, and Terry had been having one or two problems with Kenny. And I realised when we were completing the swap round, uh, there would be a lot of questions, a lot of queries, but my only concern was for the welfare of Arsenal Football Club. I phoned home to say I'd signed, and my brother said, um, Bob Paisley, I think, was in charge of Liverpool at the time. He said, he's just phoned me, he wants to sign you. And I'd already signed for Arsenal. I made the right choice. Sunderland again. Arsenal have four waiting for the cross. Flicked on by Rick Sanson was right in there, and that was Gatting! And Arsenal go two in front. Mitchley allowing for the conditions and also playing advantage. 
intelligent bit of refereeing. Sunderland, and that's a beautiful goal for Talbot. 1-1. Davis played for Ricks. Oh, good chance for Ricks. Talbot's gone right in the middle there. McDermott coming up fast. Woodcock. Sunderland outside him. Woodcock and Robson advancing into that area. And Woodcock! Sims and Woodcock getting it through there. Oh, a fabulous goal there. Ricks playing it wide. Good period this for Arsenal. Sunderland. The ball broke for him nicely. Torbert trying to turn it in. 2 0. Brian Torbert the second. Two goals in a little over a couple of minutes have suddenly put Arsenal right in the clear. Tenor there from Woodcock to Ricks. What a fine goal from Graham Ricks. That left foot so accurate. There were still flashes of inspiration and some creditable finishes, but the pressure on Terry Neal to deliver trophies began to grow. His last throw of the dice was the signing of a maverick young striker from Celtic, Charlie Nicholas, Scotland's brightest young thing, but the burden of expectation simply proved too great. I'd obviously rejected Liverpool, Manchester United and into Milan. And I thought the Arsenal had the basis of a team that was going to rebuild and get back to being one of the top clubs again. And that was the essence behind it for me, but uh, they said that I was going to transform this club, which was doing nothing for six, seven years. So it was difficult for me, but I was only 21. And here I was getting the burden of the pressure to say, it's up to you to make Arsenal great again. And a really big crowd here at Highbury today. I'm just wondering how many of them are drawn by the man wearing the number 10 shirt for Arsenal. Charlie Nicholas on the ball at the moment. With a nice back heel finding uh, Kenny Sanson. Well, he knew Charlie's reputation in Scotland was, uh, you know, he scored from, from fantastic goals, could go past people. I think his, his nutmegging was uh, second to none at the time. He would nutmeg most probably every player in training. And I think there was a lot of expected of Charlie. Charlie came down with all this um, hullabaloo and a playable image really and he was a great lad he added something to the dressing room definitely he, he was lively he used to like a night out like a lot of young people do when i came to arsenal i was 21 i was very single uh, it was also very lonely most of the players were married and it was hard work it, there wasn't a, a particular social side to the club i mean i used to dread finishing training some days because i had a whole day to face and i didn't know what i was going to do with it and that becomes concerning when you're when you're fairly young and lonely, you know, you're, you're searching for things to do and it wasn't always easy. Charlie's trouble in settling into new surroundings affected him on the pitch and a meagre return of two goals in his first 17 games did little to lift the weight from Neil's shoulders. Nicholas's talent was undoubted, but demonstrating it was a different matter. And the crowd were out there time after time, chanting for Terry's head and the, the players weren't particularly responding to Terry's style. You live or die by results and for a club like Arsenal, you have to win trophies, you have to challenge for honours. So, all right, you can't always be, because someone has to come first and someone has to come last. But if you're not getting to cup finals, you're not challenging for the title, the board of directors and the, and the fans, to a certain extent, obviously, looked at what is wrong, because we, we, we're a big club, we've got to be there. In December 1983, Neil left Arsenal on amicable terms, but he remains passionate about the club he served with such distinction. What makes Arsenal so special to me is not just the length of time that I've been there, but the people. You know, the old expression, once an Arsenal man, always an Arsenal man. But that is true for me. Well, that was the time I stayed when I should have left. And I realised after that when the club decided I tell you should go, I really should have just said, Look, yeah, I'd love to be a manager, but no, this is not the time. Whether there'd ever been a time, I don't know. Because I'd been there for eight years. The players had heard it all before. They'd seen it all before, OK? They'd seen the bald head before, OK? They're, they're not going to be stimulated by that anymore. That was the time I should have said, no, that's not one for me. I'll, off I go, I'll go somewhere else. Don made an encouraging start, and as the 1984-85 season opened, Arsenal could boast a team full of internationals and household names who on their day were capable of beating anyone. Liverpool have pulled everybody back, and Brian Talbot and Charlie Nicholas, either one of them might fancy their chances from this central position. And 
Tolbert. Yes! Two of the week for Brian Tolbert. In the same corner, the same pointed free kick. And Drummond was just as powerless as the Newcastle goalkeeper on Tuesday. And again, Anderson's joined the attack outside of Kennedy. And he got there too, and Davis was in there. Free kick there, but the advantage really is Anderson's. Tolbert! Not everyone enjoyed Arsenal's style of play, though, and however unfair and inaccurate it might have been, Don's team was branded as boring. Do you think, though, that at the moment clubs have an obligation to play entertaining football oh, yes. or to try and win back the fans generally? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, all I can do is take you back to... I remember seeing the... Uh, the finals of the men's singles at Wimbledon. Connor was playing Borg. And Connor was going down in the third set. And there was one of his fans in the crowd said, Come on, Connor. And he said, For Christ's sake, we're trying. And that's exactly our situation. For Christ's sake, we're trying. Tolbert for Arsenal. Nicholas. Just kept it in. Look for Woodcock. And what a fine header. Oh, a superb goal. Well, they, they always called us a little bit defensive. I mean, I, you couldn't ask me just to defend because I like to go forward like the, the modern wing-backs nowadays. So that we tried to work on not letting any goals in. That's the first thing. I think most successful teams do that. And then, obviously, we tried to hit teams and attack teams as well. But I think they, we, they were more defensively minded than possibly attacking minded. Allenson. Three up with him for Arsenal. Nicholas. Woodcock wants it far post. Mariner lets it run, Torbert, and it's all over. Beautifully made goal. Don was never boring. Don was uh, fun. Uh, I think he, he, he never came across as a fun-loving guy or a, ma a man who was telling jokes. And he, he did his job, and he made us aware of our def defensive responsibilities. When we lose the ball, we all get behind it and win it back as soon as possible. I mean, the base is a fantastic side, but again, it came to the stage that once we started thinking about the game and Don started thinking sometimes we need to be cautious rather than attack, attack, we need to be cautious. And it worked to a disadvantage to us. We, we were an attacking side, we should have continued to be that way. By March 1986, with little sign of a serious challenge for honours and attendances dipping, Don realised new blood was needed and stepped down after a 3-0 win over Coventry, Arsenal's fourth victory in a row. He bowed out in style. It's always a tough decision, you, you, you can't make it, but I thought about it, I thought it out, I, ch I chatted it all with my wife, uh, I'd thought about it. I wasn't really happy with the dressing room, so having given all that, that kind of going to bed, lying in bed, what about the Arsenal, how about that, how about this, all the things you do when you're thinking about things, I come to the conclusion, it's time to move on. Arsenal launched a search for a manager to bring some silverware to the plush surroundings and marble halls of Highbury. In the end, they turned to a man who'd been instrumental in the 71 double success and who, during his apprenticeship as an up-and-coming coach and manager at Millwall, had dreamed of returning to Arsenal to follow in the footsteps of the greats. Look back and see the, the, the past managers, uh, the great managers. Chapman, who was uh, the manager of the first Arsenal team to win a major trophy. And my dream and my ambition would to be actually to bring those times back here as a manager. And if I could emulate what they did in the 30s, I'd be a very, very happy person.